Okay, we're picking up our study here. We're almost through, well, we're through the, uh, uh, probably chapter 13. We'll pick, up, pick it up here toward the end of chapter 13 and 14 in just a little bit. But I want to start, we're at the top of page 173 in our notes, giving you a quotation uh, from 2 Timothy that says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works." Our introduction says that the passage in 2 Timothy is a great passage on the Word of God. It's uh, often memorized, and in just a few words we learn much about what can be gained by spending a good deal of time in God's Word. I look at uh, this passage of Scripture when it talks about doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Simply define those four things like this. The Bible tells us doctrine, what is right. The Bible tells us or gives us reproof, what is wrong. The Bible gives us correction, how to get it right. And the Bible gives us instruction and righteousness, how to keep it right. Those are simple definitions of those four terms that are used in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Um, again, just a reminder of the transitional nature of the book. We have done that. We've given you just some uh, notes. I like to review. I like to keep the context of things going. As uh, far as teaching, I think it's a, it's a good way to teach rather than just chop things off and pick up where you left off. I do enough of that already. But just try to reestablish the context and get people thinking in the vein in which you are about to teach. We've given you an outline there on uh, the five major happenings in the second half of the book at the top of 174, and then again an outline of Paul's first missionary journey. That is where we are right now, and we're going to pick up the reading in chapter 13, verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Well, there's a lot of success here, is there not? Uh, a lot of people are listening. A lot of people are getting it among the Jews. And of course, Paul and Barnabas still, although they are going to the Gentiles and they're traveling on these uh, lengthy missionary trips, this one being about 900 miles, others longer than that, what is taking place is that people are listening to what they're having to say, but there's always opposition in the neighborhood. Then Paul in Barnabas, verse 46, waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, that is to the Jews, but seeing ye put it, far from, put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, a little sarcasm there, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Old Testament prophecy. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city they knew who to get upset <laughs> the women and the chief men and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts again Paul is preaching in a synagogue as he is known to do we've given you some references to that, but um, uh, this pretty much uh, speaks for itself. In the last passage, we attempted to unpack the suitcase of faith to determine what the essential elements of the gospel 
are. In this message, Paul and Barnabas are seemingly well-received. They book a follow-up appearance for the next Sabbath in 1342. But the next Sabbath arrives, Paul and Barnabas are met with a lot of resistance. Verse 45, the Jews create such a stir that the apostles are expelled from the city and persecuted. Paul and Barnabas shake off the dust that was uh, predicted in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus predicted that. And they head for the city of Iconium. Chapter 13, verse 51, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. It's quite a response, is it not? It's so easy to get discouraged when things don't go the way we hope they would. But we have to remember, we're co-laborers with the Lord. We're co-laborers with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 tells us. God is not surprised at persecution. God is not surprised at the resistance that would come. In the many different ways resistance would come in persecution. He is not surprised. We should not be surprised. I've referred to Matthew chapter 10 several times. If you haven't read it recent, recently, need to go back to that chapter and see that Jesus warned his disciples, this isn't going to be easy. It's not a cakewalk. Sometimes people receive us very well. We see illustrations of that where people believe and people are come on board and people offer support and, and help to the disciples, to the apostles as they travel. But then we also see um, envy, resistance, persecution, threatenings, even the threat of, of death, plotting to kill individuals, um, Paul particularly, because of their faith. We read here in verse uh, chapter uh, 14 as we begin, chapters 13 and 14 chronicle the first missionary trip of Paul. So we're continuing this trip that began at the beginning of chapter 13 in Antioch of Syria. It came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. What else is new? And so spake in a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. In fact, they lied about them. They, they told falsehoods about them. They, they made them out to be um, devious, wicked, self-centered. These people are only doing this to get an audience because they want something from you. You know, that's just the, the way human beings are. We see a lot of that even in our culture today. People being poisoned against other people's opinions or positions before you even find out yourself what their position is. Somebody comes along and says, oh, you don't want to listen to them because they believe and they do and they've been and et cetera, et cetera. These are their friends and this is what their, what their uh, platform is all about. And uh, a, a great way to dissuade people is to poison people about what other people might think or might b believe. So people do that uh, about Christianity all the time. They poison people. They lie about Christians. And what Christians do, they say things you, you understand. Acts chapter 14, verse 1. A great multitude believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So signs and wonders are not, uh, have not, uh, are not off the table at this point. Signs and wonders validated the ministry of the early apostles and believers. Those who were given those signs and wonders, were, they were used to glorify God and validate their ministry in the absence, I might add, of a New Testament. Paul wasn't walking around with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John under his arms in the book of Acts and Romans. He wasn't. He, he's at the center 
of the book of Acts. He's at the center. He's the author of the book of Romans. They were not in existence. He didn't have them. So God validated the ministry of these people by accomplishing signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Verse 4, but the multitude of the city was divided. It's not unusual. And part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. I'm reading down the bottom of the page into verse number 7. That's where the sentence uh, is completed. Paul heads for the synagogue. Uh, they've had great results among the Jews, but they also uh, get disruption and resistance. They spoke boldly uh, of the Lord and uh, what follows what follows oftentimes for Christians and when you do the right thing like John the Baptist he got his head cut off Jesus got crucified Stephen was stoned Paul the Apostle he paid the, the price Peter was incarcerated persecution is guaranteed all those that live godly in Christ Jesus Paul said to Timothy uh, all those that live in, uh, godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer some form of persecution. So we pick up here in Acts 14, verses 6. We've read verses 6 and 7. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. This is reminiscent of Peter in the paralytic earlier in the book of Acts. What was that? Chapter 3, chapter 4. Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lycaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. A little superstition going on there, and they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker, and obviously the names that they gave to them had something to do with what they had observed and experienced. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates. I mean, this had to be a life-changing experience for some of these people. I mean, this is the priest of Jupiter. The people are calling them gods. The priest is bringing these offerings, oxen and garlands under the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent, they tore their clothing, and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs! Why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are, that are therein. That's a testimony there. That's not just something that's, you know, the author had to put a few extra words in there to fulfill a pre-publishing commitment. It says... God made heaven and earth, the sea, and all things that are therein. I was listening to a tape recently, and, um, and a particular preacher who was talking about the names of God on this tape, and, or CD or whatever it was, I can't remember, but I was listening to it. And, he's, and he asked the question, after he listed off, you know, 25 names of God, he said, it's important what you think of God. How do you think of God? Well, that made me stop. And if I were to put a title, what is the one word or phrase that makes me think of God? Now, at that moment, this is my, the answer to that question. It might change at other times. But when I asked myself that question, I thought, Creator, with a capital C, Creator, Creator. He is the origin of 
everything. So any other name that you could give God, how can you top creator? Creator. And that's what Paul is saying here in this particular text. Uh, let me go back and find uh, the passage here. Oh, I forget where it is. Uh, yeah, let me do this. Let me read in verse 15 and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are of men of passions. Turn from these vanities unto the living God, which, verse 15, which he is or who is the creator. He made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Could you say something more powerful or more important than that? I'm persuaded that you, that's my opinion, I'm persuaded that you can't. Who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. Remember the context of this. Don't pat us on the back. Don't bring glory to me. Remember what happened to Herod a little earlier. Don't give us the glory. He gets the glory. He is the one that's provided all of this. Sacrifice to him. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. Remember, they had, Paul and Barnabas had been there before. And they're tracking them. They're following them. And they're trying to throw monkey wrenches in the gearbox of the gospel. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. Just because you do the right thing does not ensure that you're going to be treated with favor, particularly by lost people. It isn't going to happen. Matthew chapter 10 again. There, there's persecution that comes with Christianity. Now I know I am not. I am not an individual that can speak authoritatively on this subject. I live a pretty blessed life. I really do. I don't feel persecuted. I don't feel I know the gospel is looked upon with disdain. But I don't think that I have really lost anything. In fact, I've gained because I've become a believer. I don't sense persecution, rejection. I, I know the message is rejected. There's probably some people, maybe a lot of people out there that don't like me for what I stand for and what I represent. But they pretty much leave me alone. They don't bother me with that. My point is this. I don't speak as an expert on persecution. I can't. I don't. And I'm not going to pretend to. But I want you to notice here in verse, let's pick this up in verse number, they ran, uh, verse 15, we've read, whom time past suffered all nations. Verse 16, nevertheless he left not himself without witness. That's the Lord. Verse 18, and with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people. Verse 19, there came thither certain Jews they stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. How be it? As the disciples stood round about him, he rose up. <laughs> he went back into the city. I remember the first time I read this, I thought, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> He's crazy. They've just stoned this guy. And what does he do? They thought he was dead. Well, what does he want to do? Go back and say, na 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 <laughs> You tried to kill me, but you didn't. I don't know. But he's not dissuaded. <laughs> he is going back and he's going to finish the job that he started. He rose up, came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. What takes place here in this chapter mirrors the healing uh, Peter in the paralytic of Acts chapter number three. The engagement concludes <laughs> with the stoning of Paul. Um, that particular invitation didn't go very well. I've given many invitations as a preacher. 
I've never, I'm sure I've got a lot of dirty looks, but I've never been, uh, no one's ever thrown at me, or at least maybe they did, but they didn't hit me. Let's put it that way. They, I was supernaturally protected. But Paul speaks of his experiences and his persecutions in 2 Corinthians when he writes, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Wow, he has had some difficult times. He can speak about persecution from experience. There's no question about that. We pick up in verse 21 of chapter 14 at the bottom of page 176. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples. So this wasn't just a one trip through and trying to impact and influence people. There was accountability that was expected in uh, the ministry of Paul and in the conversions, the salvation experiences of those that they ministered to. What they do, uh, Paul and Barnabas, they go back to these places where they have ministered, where they have seen results, where they have seen people come to Christ as Savior, and they want to go back and they want to bring them some more. They want to reassure them, they want to confirm them, and they want to e encourage them teach them and give them more this is discipleship this is what discipleship is all about discipleship is more than evangelism now this may be just my impression but when i think of evangelism i think of a uh, uh, in one time opportunity gather uh, five thousand people in a big auditorium in a stadium and bring in the big name preacher and he preaches the gospel message and we have a grand invitation and people, and I've been in meetings like that and, and I'm not opposed to them, but that's an evangelistic meeting and people come forward and they're dealt with. As long as it is done biblically and responsibly, I'm all for that. Anytime you can get 5,000 people or 2,000 people or 500 people together, particularly when half of them or more are lost people, uh, I'm for it. I'm for it. But we need to be responsible when we get people like that. We don't need to soft sell Christianity. We need to, what must I believe to believe? We need to be clear on what it means to be a Christian and how you become a Christian. That's very important. But discipleship is, look at verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Now, right now, I'm, all, I'm also teaching the book of Hebrews in another class that I'm doing right now. And uh, the book of Hebrews... Uh, written to the Hebrews, I believe lost and saved Hebrews, the book, if there's a main thing in, a theme in the whole book, it is the superiority of the ministry of Jesus Christ to all of the other things that Judaism revered. That's probably the main theme. But a secondary theme is this. Continue in the faith. If you are not a believer but you are interested in truth and you're moving in the direction of faith in Christ, don't stop, don't quit. And if you are a believer, there's persecution, there's difficult times that will come. Those people needed to be confirmed, exhorted to continue speaking of Hebrews, to continue in the faith. And I believe those are probably the two main themes of the book of Hebrews. Number one, the superiority of the ministry of Christ, the person of Christ, over everything that the Old Testament Jew had revered and held in high esteem. He's God manifest in the flesh. Thy throne, O God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, 
I believe verses verse 6 through 8, somewhere in there. But the second thing, secondary thing is to continue, to continue. Don't give up. Now, I see that as part of Paul's ministry as he goes on these missionary journeys. And it, and it makes me think, and I know there's a lot of controversy about this, it makes me think that, uh, or confirms in my mind to a greater degree, that Paul the Apostle was the individual who actually penned the book of Hebrews. Now, Paul puts his name on 13 of 14 epistles. If he did write Hebrews, he doesn't put his name on the book of Hebrews. That'd be easy if he did, obviously. But he does on the other 13. I wonder if he didn't put his name on the book of Hebrews for this reason. I wonder if this isn't the reason that he knew that the book would not be received well because he didn't have a good reputation among all the Hebrews. Obviously, when you read the book of Acts, he didn't have a good reputation. He was slandered. He was uh, lied about. He was uh, persecuted. And I imagine uh, he was seen by many Jews as a troublemaker, as a traitor to the Old Testament law. So if his name was on that book as the author, some people would never pick it up and read it. I don't know. I know that it's arguable. There is another side of that argument. It doesn't matter. The book of Hebrews was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, so I can buy that. Through much tribulation, we're going to enter into the kingdom of God, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perge, they went down into Italia. Verse 21 says that Paul and Barnabas retraced their steps and confirmed the saints in those cities. Confirmed, what does that mean? That he, they strengthened them. They reestablished them in the faith. He exhorted, encouraged them to continue and warned them of the tribulation that lay ahead for them. Chapter 14, verse 26 and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. That's chapter number 13, verse 1 through 5. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. So they're coming back to Antioch. That's where they, from the place that they departed from in chapter 13, as I said, 1 through 5. They're coming back now to give a report to them. They gathered the church together, verse 27. They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles, and there they abode long time with the disciples. I mentioned this in an earlier lesson, and that is the importance of missionaries spending time with, particularly with what I would call ascending church, that is the church from which their journeys have originated. I might also add, it's not a bad time to spend as much time as you could with other churches of like faith that support you. So those people get to know you, get to know who you are, etc., etc. So they're back in Antioch and they are um, sharing with the leadership, the elders at Antioch that are mentioned back in chapter 13, what has happened. In Matthew chapter 10, it's the commissioning of the disciples the 12, Jesus warned them of the resistance that they would meet in preaching the gospel. We see that in chapter 10, verses 1 through 36. Really, the whole chapter of Matthew deals with that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm really incompetent. I am not, I don't have the experience to talk about persecution to, uh, uh, among Christians today. We live, the American church lives at least for a while. I see things closing in on us, and they are. The American church still lives largely in a glass bubble 
we are protected. But there are, there are uh, issues on the horizon where Bible-believing people are going to legally be shut up you are going to be, if you preach the truth, the whole counsel of God, you are going to be a criminal and you will be criminally prosecuted for your hate speech. Today, the issue of gender identity is a big deal. I read an article even this morning about California who is revisiting how they're teaching their children in public education. We're not going to talk about female reproductive parts. We're not going to refer to them as female or male. We're just going to refer to them by the name of the particular object. We can't call them female because maybe the female feels like she or he or it is a male. So this particular individual who feels like a male should not be discouraged from feeling like a male even though this male has female reproductive parts. We wouldn't want to confuse our children, would we? <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't believe the stupidity, the idiocy of people. What is the big deal? Why would we make that a law? Oh my. Well, anyway, that's the world we live in today, and persecution may be on the horizon for the church. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this, this know also that in the last days perilous, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. We're going to turn righteousness on its head upside down. Call good evil and evil good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. And we could go on, and we do, on page 179. And uh, as we come down to the end of chapter number 14, we come to the completion of Paul's first missionary journey. So what do we have? What do we have? We have uh, Paul's first missionary journey. Starts in chapter 13, 14. In chapter 15, we have the Council of Jerusalem. They all got to get their act together. I mean, They've been traveling and they've been meeting all kinds of people with all kinds of beliefs. And the issue of the Old Testament law comes to the forefront. What are we supposed to think of everything that Moses has taught us? How does that fit in with this gospel message? Do we just ignore and deny all of the Old Testament and start all over with a clean sheet of paper in the New Testament? What does that Old Testament have to do with me today? Of course, the issue of legalism comes along. The law was given by Moses, the Bible says, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 that the law was a schoolmaster. It was our teacher to bring us unto Christ. The law isn't bad, but it has to be viewed scripturally and properly. And we have to understand the difference between liberty in Christ and license or licentiousness. We have to understand the difference between our freedom in Christ and our liberty in Christ and the law or violations of the law 
that become license or licentiousness. We need to get a balance, and we need to be careful of the lo- the not the lo- the yoke of legalism. That will be our next session when we look at Acts chapter 15. Just a reminder, we're working our way through here. We're more than halfway through our study in the book of Acts, and um, I'm going to ask you to take time, go through these previous maybe three or four chapters, reread them again, keep them fresh, and one more challenge is this. Try to go through every chapter and pick out a word or a phrase that will remind you of the major content of that chapter. For example, I'll give you one. The first chapter, and ye shall be witnesses. That shows up everywhere throughout this book. So if I were to do this, and I have, witnesses is the word that I use to identify what is found in Acts chapter 1. So why don't you go through the first 14 chapters of the book of Acts and think of a word or a phrase that identifies the content of that chapter and then memorize it. So by the time we're done here, we get through chapter 28, you can walk your way through mentally every chapter and remember the sequence of events that take place in the book. Thank you. Let's take a break.